All right, so there in Matthew chapter 4, uh, look down at verse 18 again. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they, became, they straightway left their nets and followed him. Now I'd like you to hold your place there and turn over to Mark chapter number 1. Mark chapter number 1. All right, now Mark chapter 1, look down at verse number 16. The Bible says, Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And what I'm going to preach on this morning is becoming uh, fishers of men. And this is going to be part one of a two-part series. Now, basically what I'm going to be dealing with today is going to be who and where we are to be fishers of men. And I'm going to be bringing some more practical sermons on soul winning. And next week, Lord willing, we're going to be getting into the how and the nuts and bolts of it. As we prepare for making this big emphasis with the soul winning marathon and so on, we're just going to be kind of covering some basic Bible doctrine as far as this is concerned. But we're going to be dealing with, he says, come after me in one passage. He says, follow me in the other passage. And he tells him, he says, I will make you fishers of men. And then the other way he says it is he says, I will make you to become fishers of men. Now, some people will often say, like, if you get saved, you'll automatically go soul winning. You're automatically going to evangelize and so on. I had somebody tell me that the other day. You know, if you're truly saved, you're going to sh share your faith with others. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that this is not talking about salvation. This is talking about following and coming after Jesus Christ. They're two totally different things. Uh, in order to get saved, it's as simple as believing on the Lord and putting your faith and trust to save, uh, on Jesus to save you from hell. That's all, and believing in the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But in order to be a follower of Jesus Christ, there is sacrifice that has to be made. You have to take up your cross. You have to leave things behind. You have to make a decision to follow the Lord with your life. And he says, follow me. And one of the things that you see a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ doing, is someone who is becoming a fisher of men. And so, it, you know, it's just not true where these people say, well, if you get truly get saved, you will become a fisher of men. No, if you follow Jesus and you make a decision to become a fisher of men and follow Jesus in this matter of fishing for men, you will become one. And, and I say that to let you know that it is possible. You know, this is not just something where we're going through the motions. We're not just, you know, this is not a futile effort. We can make a difference. We can make an impact. We can get large numbers of people saved. And that's what we're endeavoring to do with the marathon. That's what we're endeavoring to do every Sunday and hopefully more and more and more as our church grows and as people uh, are able to do that. And so this is, this is a decision we make. And God, Jesus said, follow me. Be my disciple. And one of the things he's telling us to follow him in is being a fisher of men. In Mark chapter 1, if you look there at uh, Mark 1, uh, you looked at 17. He says, come after me and I will make you fishers of, to become fishers of men. And look at verse 18. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Now, oftentimes you'll hear this language in Baptist churches even where you have to forsake things to get saved. You have to forsake your sin, you have to forsake your old life, you have to turn to Jesus and all this type of thing. But the Bible never says that. But he, what he does say is that you're going to have to forsake some things in order to be a fisher of men, in order to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't turn from our sins or turn from our old lifestyle like everybody seems to want to preach. That's work salvation if you're turning to get saved. But, you know, salvation is so easy, it requires no work. It doesn't require, you know, going out soul winning or anything else. It just requires faith. On the other hand, following Christ 
is a, is a daily commitment and it's a lifetime commitment. It's one of those things where you make a commitment to your wife or you make a commitment to do something, you know, or whatever, and you're just like honoring that. And every day you're like, oh, I'm presented with a choice. Do I, am I, am I going to stay faithful to my wife? Am I going to stay faithful to my promise, to my kids, and all of these types of things? And every day you're like, absolutely, I am. And you make that decision every morning. You make that decision. I'm going to stay faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm going to do what the Lord wants me to do. Even if I'm presented other opportunities and sins and temptations to do otherwise. And that's, that's what we're talking about, a lifestyle of following the Lord. Notice that phrase, come ye after me, in verse 17. Come ye after me. In Matthew 16, 24, he says it this way. Then said Jesus unto his disciple, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take and take up his cross, and follow me. And so if we're going to follow Christ and fish for men, it's going to take some self-sacrifice and denying ourselves and saying we're going to deny ourselves some pleasure. There's a lot of places that you could be today. There's a lot of places you could be on Soul Winning, soul winning Afternoon. You could go in fellowship. You could hang out. You could uh, eat dinner. You could do a lot of things. But the Bible says that this is the thing that we do when we follow the Lord. He says, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. And it takes self-denial. It's hard work to get out there and walk and knock the doors and all of that. And so this is so important. The cost of being a soul winner is the cost of following Jesus. Let's take a look at some passages that Jesus talks about being a disciple and following the Lord and coming after him and so on. Let's look over to uh, Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. In verse number 27, I'll point this out, and then we'll read a few more verses in the passage. But notice what the Bible says in Luke 14, 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, I've, you know, I posted up a, a video with a thumbnail of the Mennonites uh, on YouTube, you know, and I basically remember that sermon where I went through the Mennonite uh, in the uh, Armenian creed and talked about what they believe and how you have to be a disciple of Christ or you're not saved and all of that kind of thing. And I had somebody ask, well, what about Matthew 7? You know, don't you have to have fruits in order to be saved and all of that or you're not really saved and so on? And listen, they get so confused because they're lost. They have never been presented with the clear gospel or they've rejected the clear gospel of faith alone. And so they're confused by these passages. And they'll read this verse and say, well, see there, if you don't bear your cross and follow Jesus and come after Jesus, you're not saved. But that's not what it says. A disciple is a follower of Jesus. There are people who, who, who get saved, who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and, have, and do not do no works, have no fruit. And the Bible tells us that in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, no works are required. And so we don't need to be confused on this matter, but there is a cost of discipleship, not for salvation. There is a cost of living for God and following Him. And if we follow Christ, we will fish for men. It's part of being a disciple of Christ. All these people, you know, that have these discipleship programs, right? That you'll see in these, these Calvinists have them. And every, every church has a discipleship program. And they sit there and they basically just make them go through all these pages and read all these doctrines and study the Bible and stuff. And I'm not against studying the Bible. I think we should. But they're learning the doctrinal creeds of all, you know, of their church and all that kind of thing. But what are they, what are they not covering in most churches today that is the most crucial part, the part that... Jesus emphasizes over and over and over again about being a disciple. It's going soul winning. He says, if you'll come after me, I will make you to become fishers of men. It's not being covered. Look back at uh, verse 25. Uh, Luke 14, 25. And there, were, there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, that's a harsh statement. Are we supposed to just hate our family members at this point? Listen, what, I'm, what he's dealing with here is the fact that there is going to be division naturally when we decide to follow Jesus with our life. It's going to bring division. 
And we have to choose to follow the Lord, even if there's, you know, uh, you, na you name it, brothers, sisters, uh, grandparents, you know, you know, adult children, whatever, they're going to not like it. They're going to go a different way. They're going to be mad cousins, all of these people, friends, and so on. And he's saying that you're going to need to make a choice to deny yourself and deny those people that you care about and follow the Lord and leave the old life behind. That's what he's saying there. Notice what he says in verse 27. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now listen to this. There's a cost to following the Lord. There is. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. I, it brings to mind a story I heard about the calculation error that some city made. I, I've heard this story a long time ago, and I can't remember what city it was. But they made a, a, a calculation error, and they left a zero off the budget, and they sent, submitted the bid to, to build a bridge across some river, and it was an accounting error. It was, a, it was an estimated error, and they got halfway through and realized, and I don't know how they would make that decision, they didn't have enough to finish the bridge. So now they breached their contract, and now, you know, the bridge, you know, how do you sort that all out, right? So there's a bridge that goes out into the middle and stops, and they don't have enough money to finish the bridge. And what is that? It's a joke. It's something you laugh about, and you say, good night, you know, take care of your business. And so he's saying that if you're going to set out to accomplish something for the Lord, and you're going to set out to, to follow God with your life, and to make a decision to live for God, it's going to cost you something. And you want to be like Paul, who's, who is determined in his heart to finish right, to finish his chorus. And he, that's what we want to do, is to, to not look behind, not look at the present, but just press on to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so this is something, there's a cost of discipleship. Do you see that? If you're going to come after me, there's going to be a cost, he says. Verse 30, saying, uh, this man, they, they begin to mock him and say, this man began to build and, it was, not, and was not able to finish it. Or what king going to uh, make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. And likewise, whosoever he uh, be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. And so he's saying there's a cost and there's a battle to be fought. Notice what his idea there is, is that if you're going to go out and get into the battle for the Lord Jesus Christ, for the souls of men, it's going to, you're going to make a decision to get out there. Now, with the Lord, we're victorious. With the Lord, we can win. We need to know that in our hearts. Nothing can stop us. I mean, if the God be for us, who can be against us? But there is something. We need to take time and we need to say, you know what, and make this a conscious decision. Now, I'm not talking about a decision to get saved and, you know, really follow after the Lord. I'm talking about a, the decision to get in the battle and be on the fight and to try to win our loved ones to the Lord, our friends, our family, and the strangers that we see on soul winning visitation. That is what we are deciding to do. And it's a battle, and there's, there, are, there are real enemies, there are real costs in our life. And he tells us, he uses this term, that you, he wants us to forsake all and follow him. That's, that's a hard pill to swallow. But if God asks us to do that, we can do that. And so there's a real cost. And so we have seen Jesus saying, follow me. Come after me. He constantly saying this to different people as he's gathering these believers unto him to go and, and leave their nets and leave their jobs as a publican and so on to follow him and be a soul winner. And so, and I'm not saying that everybody, obviously we have to work jobs and pay the bills and so on, but there's a lot of sacrifice that we make. The world looks at us and say, man, you're spending all day out there, you know, at church and soul winning on Sunday. You're going out other days of the week. You're, you're, you're fr your free time is going out and getting people saved. You know, good night, man. What are you doing? They don't understand. They don't understand. We've counted the cost. We've seen the opposition, but we know, we know that there's rewards in heaven. We know that it's a real battle and that their souls going to hell. We know it. 
We know what's at stake. And he says, follow me. Come after me. And I will make you to become fishers of men. And so that's what I want to encourage you to do today is to come after Christ and become a fisher of men. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I want to talk a little more about this cost. I'll show you a few people that he called on to. Now, we know that these disciples, that they, the 12 disciples and other people followed him as well. But he would often just say, come after me, follow me. Just leave what you're doing and let's go soul winning. But notice here, there are some people who heard that call from the Lord and did not choose to follow. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Fo Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. Now, of course, this was an interesting thing for Jesus to say, but I don't, you know, this man, I don't believe he followed. And of course, Jesus was just saying he wasn't living in a life of luxury. He wasn't living some glamorous life. I mean, people came and they saw that this man had people following him. And so, and he's preaching to multitudes and so on. And I don't know what was in his mind. And he's like, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, well, hey, I'm, where am I going tonight? You know, I'm going to be sleeping out under the stars, you know, pulling acorns out of my back and so on. And, uh, you know, so this is the situation. He's, he's saying there's a cost. Look at verse 59. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Well, now, you know, I don't believe this is a case where his father had just died and needs to be, you know, they need to go get shovels and just put him right in the grave. You know, this is a situation where his dad may die, you know, sometime in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Listen, the time to serve the Lord isn't 20 years from now. And I've seen people who have just wasted their life away and have said, you know what, I'm going to just focus on working a job and working 80 hours a week. And I'm going to try to, and when, I get, when I get to a point, I'm going to retire and then when I retire, that's when I'm going to just, you know, focus all on ministry, all on soul winning. And you know what? Just a few years into that, they're not doing anything for God. You know, they barely go to church, you know, and everything else comes into their, into their life and throws, you know, throws them for a loop. And I don't want to forget that. And they, they didn't count the cost. They need to, to get in the battle right now and not just wait till later. Don't say, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go and preach the kingdom of God. You say, if you're looking for excuses, there's a lot of them. You can pick your excuses not to go soul winning. There's a lot of them. But, you know, the, the fact is, Jesus said, he just, he'll take out every one of those excuses and just rip them up. If you want to go and take them to him, he'll, he'll come up with an explanation for you. He'll come up with a way for you to go. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid thee, them farewell, which are at my home and at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow, and looking back is fit to, for the kingdom of God. And so if you're going to take all these scriptures together that we've looked at from the beginning of the sermon till now, you'll see that the, the, one of the key ingredients of following the Lord, to coming after the Lord, is being a fisher of men, uh, becoming a fisher of men. And that's, that's what we're dealing with today. Now, in John chapter 15, we recently, you don't have to turn there, but I recently preached on this uh, about, you know, dealing with the fruit of the soul winner and how we get people saved. Now, in John 15, 5, he says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye, sh ye will, and it shall be done. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. And listen to this. So shall ye be my disciples. So I, in that sermon, I established that the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth stoles is wise. The fruit of a Christian is other, making other Christians and getting other people saved. Okay, now according to the Bible here, if you'll abide in Christ, you will bear much fruit and you'll glorify God in heaven. And, he, and then he uses this phrase and he says, so will you be my disciples. And so no matter what, you, way, what way you slice it, 
being a follower of Christ and coming after Christ includes and is a very large part of going soul winning. No matter what way you slice it. Mark 1, he says, come after me and I will make you to become fishers of men. Jesus was always soul winning. And he was always, listen to this, he was always soul winning and he was always taking people and say, follow me and I will make you a soul winner. I'll teach you how to do it. He sent the disciples out two by two. He gave them specific instructions on what to do when he came into a city and so on. And he gave them instructions and sent them out. And soul winning is not a calling for a few. It is a command for all Christians. And so it's so simple. Now turn over to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. All right, now in John 1, let's uh, jump down to verse 35. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looked, uh, looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And the, then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which uh, is to, be, uh, to say, being interpreted master, Where dwellest thou? And he said unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt, and, he abo and, they, and abode with him that day. And it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak was, uh, and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now listen to this. And he, he first findeth his own brother Simon, and said unto him, We have found Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus held, beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is interpreted uh, by interpretation a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip, and said unto, Philip, unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and said unto him, We have found him, and of whom Moses in the law and of the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Jesus said unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming uh, to him, and said, unto, uh, said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knoweth thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip uh, called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Now I'm going to point out a few things in this passage. Now let me make a few emphasis in 1 John. The first emphasis I want to, or excuse me, in John 1 I should say. Uh, the first emphasis that I want to make is that there's an importance that we need. Notice the phrase in verse 41, in 43, and in verse 45. He says, and we see here, he first findeth. Verse 43, and he findeth Philip. In verse 45, Philip findeth Nathanael. And so there's an importance, there's an importance in, emphasized in the scriptures about, about finding people and getting them saved. It, there's an import, the, um, the emphasis is the importance of seeking out people to win to Christ. We see that word findeth. Jesus went out finding people. He walked all over the place and he found people. Jesus uh, and those people that followed Jesus, they went out finding people and so on. So fo following Christ is fishing for men. That's, that's the, the fact of the matter. Verse 19 uh, of Matthew 4, I'll remind you of this. You don't have to turn there. But he says, and he said unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Uh, in, he says, come after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. So the first point I want to kind of drive home here is who should we seek out to win to Christ? Well, I think we need to make a point in verse 41. Let's take a look at that again. In verse 41, he says, He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and said unto him, and so in this passage, we see that we should seek out our family members, our brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, whoever, to try to get them saved. We need to make a point if we truly love them. You say, well, I love my family. I'm all about family. Blood's thicker than water and all that stuff. Well, give them the gospel. 
You say, well, it might cause division at the family reunion. Give them the gospel. Because you know what? It might cause division at the family reunion. But Jesus said to expect that. But would you rather get somebody saved at the family reunion? Or would you rather let them all go to hell? You say, well, it might split things up. We need to make a point to seek out our own family members. He findeth his own brother. And he tells him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted to Christ. We're saved, right? We're, we found the Lord Jesus Christ. We put our faith in him. We found out it's a free gift. and We just receive it by faith. We ask the Lord to save us. And we have this message that we, have, we hold in our hands that can change somebody's de eternal destination. And we withhold. We hold back. And we don't give that gospel message to them. Have courage. Go get your brother. Go get your family member and win them to the Lord. Do it. Don't be afraid. The Bible says in verse 40, um, 45, look at this. 44. Now, um, well, yeah, well, yeah, here we go. 44. Now, Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, Hey, we found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. We found him. And so here is a man that goes and seeks out his friend to get saved. We ought to make an emphasis of going to try to witness to our friends. Listen, friends and family can be sometimes the hardest people that get the courage to go and speak to. Now, you, you might feel like if you're just, you know, if you're not been soul winning very long and you're, it's kind of scared about it. You might have feelings of trepidation of what they might think or if this might cause division. Or if you've been saved a long time, you might feel bad that you haven't witnessed to them. And say, well, you know, they're going to look at me as, you know, a hypocrite for not giving them the gospel since I've been saved for a long time. Well, we need to get past all that. We need to get past whatever fears or whatever it is. And we need to just seek those people out. Friends. Close friends, acquaintances people we work with, and so on. This is part of soul winning, by the way. It's not just door to door. It's getting people that we are close to, that we know, uh, saved. Verse 43, he says, um, you know, verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus, and, and that's, of course, uh, Andrew and Simon. And Jesus beheld him and said, uh, that, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Uh, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is, be, uh, which is by interpretation a stone. The following day, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find a Philip and said unto him, follow me. So here's somebody that he doesn't know. Here's somebody he goes and he seeks out and he says, come after me. And listen, I believe that it is our job not just to go after friends and family, but it's to go after strangers. Go to the next city over and go knock their door and say, hey, listen, Philip, let me tell you about you know, Jesus, of course, says, let me tell you about myself, you know, but we tell him about Jesus. And we should seek out strangers. And we see this, this principle, find it, he first find it, he findeth Philip, he findeth Nathaniel. And we go and find people, and, you know, I like the door-to-door -door method, but we also need to go uh, other places, too, to our friends and so on, and family and all of that. But we like the door-to-door -door method. Why? Because uh, it's, so, it's, it's a place where people's guards are down. It's at their home. They can just talk to us. It's not in a crowd and so on. And so I'm going to give you some more practical advice here about how we can do this matter. Uh, basically, we're talking about becoming a fisher of men. And, of course, this idea is something that doesn't happen overnight. We're becoming something, right? And so he, Jesus, I believe, is teaching them how to be a soul winner. Jesus is saying, follow me. Look, I'm going to just do this thing. I'm going to go from city to city, from house to house. I'm just going to be giving the gospel to people, and I'm going to be training you to do the same thing. And I'm going to eventually send you out to do the same thing. And we do the same thing today. We, we want as a church to equip you and to teach you, and the Word of God equips us and teaches us, methods that work in ways that we can explain the gospel to people so clearly so they get it, and that's what we want to do. And that's uh, going to be the kind of the subject matter of, of the next sermon Sunday morning, next Sunday morning sermon on being a fisher, becoming a fisher of men and how we do that. But how, how can we, how, or how, when, and where uh, should we fish for men? Well, we should look for opportunities. This idea of finding someone means that you're taking initiative to go out to do this matter. It takes initiative. 
It takes you saying, you know what, I'm going to have to get off my tail and put on some clothes and put on some shoes and I'm going to have to go out there and get that person saved. You're going to have to take time out of your day. You're going to have to change your schedule. You're going to have to make a plan of action to do this. Because if you don't make the plan, you say, well, I'm just going to wait for the opportunity to arise. It won't come. Or you'll miss it because you're in a habit of being lazy or whatever, right? So we need to be very careful. Like, we, we need to take the opportunities that come to us, and we also need to seek out the opportunities and find the opportunities. Go and find these people and get them saved. Don't just wait for the moment. Seek out the moment. Now, Jesus went and found others. They went out and found others. And so what are opportunities that we can go soul winning? What, what are opportunities that we can find people to get saved? What are these opportunities that we have? Well, first of all, and this is the most obvious, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but um, turn to Romans chapter 10. <laughs> I think you probably think this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. And it is, but um, it is an emphasis that we're going to make. It's the clear Scripture and command here. But this first point is one way that we should win and wear as far as fishing for men is a regular scheduled soul winning time. And, you know, I have to say, uh, you know, in our, the life of our church and the long scheme of things, we've had, you know, regular scheduled soul winning times and then that's laxed, right? Not recently, but we've let off on that at certain points and so on. But, you know, never again, you know, as long as, as far as I'm concerned, never again, these regular scheduled soul winning times, we're not going to do less. We're going to do more as far as I'm concerned. And so we, these are opportunities for us to say, you know what, I'm going to get involved and do this. Now, obviously, not everybody can walk uh, long distances. You know, um, sometimes we have elderly people and so on, and there's other ways that we can go soul winning. But I'm going to show you uh, from the Bible those other ways we go soul winning here in just a moment. But according to, jo to John chapter 20, uh, the Bible tells us that we are to seek out people to get them saved. And so Romans chapter 10, verse 13, uh, says in verse uh, 13, he says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring good tidings, uh, or glad tidings of good things. Now, according to the Bible here, we need to be sent. And so there, in the Bible, Jesus is basically, if you'll see the pattern, Jesus is coming and saying, follow me. And he's teaching them how to be fishers of men. And then he's sending them out to go soul winning. We also see the testimony of Peter and of Paul. As, he's basic, as these men go, the apostles, they, they uh, preach to them. They teach them how. And then they take them all out. Peter's out there preaching to the crowd. He's got 120 soul winners out there getting people saved. And this is just the pattern that we see over and over daily from house to house. They're going soul winning and so on. And so this idea of being sent is the idea of following Jesus and learning, being a disciple of Jesus and then going yourself. Follow me and I will make you to become a fisher of of men. And so what we want to do is make people to become a fisher of men. John chapter 20, if you'll turn over there. John chapter 20. I referenced it, but I hadn't turned had you turn there yet. Let's go ahead and read this verse. John chapter 20 and verse number 19. The Bible says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were his, the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then the, said Jesus unto them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And of course, we see the Great Commission given in Matthew 28 and in uh, the other Gospels in Acts chapter 1 and so on, where Jesus has given us a command to go out and to win people, get them saved and get them baptized and get them in church and help them to be discipled. But this phrase here ties into the message that we're dealing with because he says, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. In this passage, he says, 
Even so as the Father, he says, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. The Lord wants us to go. The Lord wants us to go. And so what is a regular scheduled soul winning time? It's an opportunity for us to go. It's being sent to do this. But you know what? Beyond you know, our church organizing it and doing it, the Lord Jesus Christ is sending you as a disciple. He's telling you to go. So I bring this up because many churches today have just gotten rid of the regular scheduled soul winning times. And this is a shame. And that we see this all the time. We see, I have people ask me, uh, we have people that come here occasionally, right? They, they're within five hours from here and they go to other churches in the, in, you know, the, they go to the best church they can find in their area and they can't find any church with a scheduled soul winning time. And they go and they, they basically go to the church and then they're the ones, they, they meet, af, meet up their friends and so on and they go out themselves. And they're taking that initiative upon themselves. And, you know, some of those places, they'll say, well, the pastor's not against us, but he won't promote it. He won't get up and say anything. He won't organize it. He won't say anything. He won't, you know, encourage it. He won't do anything. He'll say, well, it's good. I'm glad you're doing that. But here's the thing. I think that, you know, like our church, we have a lot of people that go out. A lot of people support the effort. A lot of people pray and a lot of people go. I believe uh, if, the, if the leadership in the church were just to say, you know what, we're going to do a regular scheduled uh, time not everybody can go not everybody's going to go but I, I believe it would be a, a big percentage if they would just make the emphasis if they would start caring about fishing for men caring about their brother and sister their neighbor and so on there would be people that would go it's a lack of leadership it's a lack of leadership and we'll reap a harvest where we place the emphasis in leadership and in these churches it's a lack of leadership and it comes down to the heart uh, they're, they're not, if you're not, it's like the old saying, if you're not fishing, you're not following. It's part and parcel of what we're supposed to be doing. If you're, you say, well, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I've, I've studied all the theological textbooks and read my Bible. And you're not soul winning. What, you're not following Jesus. You're not a disciple of Jesus. So another opportunity. Turn over to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. The Bible says in verse number 6, he says, um, I'll give you a second to get there. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and, now were, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they uh, were come to Mysia, they uh, uh, essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not, and they passing uh, by Mysia came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man of Macedonia and pray, uh, prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering uh, that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Now listen, there are some great things happening in regions outside of our own. I mean, in places around the world that we don't normally think about. I think about this Jamaican mission trip where just, you know, over a thousand people were saved. I think about other missions trips that I've been hearing about lately. Uh, I, I've been praying for this. Uh, there's, they're making preparation uh, to go out to the Philippines and different places. But there are just incredible opportunities here and around the world to, to go soul winning. And not, I know that not everybody's capable of traveling. But there are opportunity, one opportunity to go to be a soul winner, to, to find people, uh, you know, just a, a way that we can be a, just add fruit, you know, to add rewards to our account and get people saved, right, is to go on a missions trip sometime. You know, maybe there's a third world country or a, a place where it's cheaper to go and you could save up for it. But you know what? It would be a, I think that would be a better goal than saving up for a fishing boat or some recreational sports vehicle or something like that. Maybe you would like to go on a missions trip someday. Maybe we'll sponsor one uh, one day. And uh, there are places around the world that need to hear the gospel, need to hear pe the preaching of the word, and that are wide open. And the fields are totally wide into harvest where you just go and people, the fruit is just practically falling off the tree. You're just, you're just going and you're grabbing it just as fast filling up your bushel basket as fast as you can 
And so, listen, maybe that's something you could pray about. And maybe one day there's going to be some people that want to come from our church. Maybe we could pitch in financially. If you can't go yourself, maybe that would be something you could help. You have a burden. You have it laid up. You feel a burden on your heart to help somebody to go or to go yourself. And I know some people aren't mobile. You know, obviously Paul was a man who traveled all over the world. He wasn't a family man, though, right? And there are people that have a, a lot harder time traveling around because they have responsibilities and families or uh, other deficiencies, things that they are not able to do that. But you know what? There are other people willing to go. And so these, this is an opportunity uh, for us to help and to fund and to go if we, if we want to. This is an opportunity to fish for men. And according to 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 3, when we take part in another man's labor as far, because we're co-laborers with Christ, we are part of the rewards that we get in heaven, the people that they get saved on our behalf. When we're helping other people to get saved, you know, through somebody else's labor, we're part, that is part of our rewards. So this is just something to think about. Another option, another way that we um, can go soul winning, that we can, you know, get this job done, that we can become fishers of men, is that, uh, you know, is special events, like all-day soul winning marathon sessions, you know, where we just make a, 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 an emphasis. And in the future, I'd like to just do this again and again and again, where we emphasize certain parts of the map, you know, We'll go to maybe a small city. Uh, these other little places around, these ones that are in the county adjacent to us, they need the gospel. We need to give it to them. Nobody else is going around here. And so not systematically and not with a clear gospel, it doesn't seem like. And so we want to do that. And we want to go to regions beyond, to Jerusalem and, and to all the uttermost parts of the earth. And so there's a lot of things that we could be doing on a Sunday, a lot of things you could be doing on a Saturday. But you know what? This is a high calling. This is a great opportunity to go, uh, to give a Saturday to the Lord and just say, you know what? We're going to go and we're just going to go soul winning all day. You know, it's worth the effort. It's worth the effort. You say, that's hard work. Yes, I know. I know it is, but it's worth the effort. Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due seasons we, we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do un, uh, good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Listen, there are opportunities that present themselves to us all the time, whether it's your friends and family, whether it's you know the church opportunities and so on. And, but people just constantly let these opportunities to... to find their loved one, to find their friend, to find people, to get them saved, to go through the gospel with them, and they let those pass by. And we are not guaranteed other opportunities. That's why he says, as ye have therefore opportunity, that's when you do it. And we have opportunity. We have an opportunity for us today. It's an open door to go and get souls saved. I mean, it is wide open, and we need to be about the Father's business. We need to be fishers of men. We've been sent out by the Lord Jesus Christ. This church is sending you out. And if we go, we shall reap a harvest of souls. If we faint not, if we just don't give up or get tired or just quit, we will reap. It's totally worth it. What are some other times and places that we should be fishing for men? I'm going to, I want to Focus a little bit for a minute on this idea of winning our close family and friends, okay? So turn with me to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. And I'm going to try to give you some ways that we can do that. Now, Mark chapter 5, let's look down at verse number 18. And when he was come into the ship... He that, hath been, uh, he that had been possessed uh, with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great thing the Lord hath done for thee, and hath, uh, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Now why, was this, why were they marveling? Well, because they knew him. 
that in this region, in Decapolis, they knew who this guy was. They knew that he was the man that was demon possessed up in the up in the around the graves and just cutting himself. And they would try to, you know, restrain him, put him in a straitjacket, so to speak, chains. It actually says to try to stop him from harming himself and you know just just cutting himself and you know looking like he's going to kill himself and harming himself and all of that. And they're trying to help him, but nothing in this world could help him, right? He was filled with a demon. Psychology is not going to help him. Sitting him on a couch and, you know, giving him therapy is not going to help him. Giving him some dr drugs is not going to help him. Those drugs probably make it easier for the demons to come in. I don't know. I'm just my theory. But, uh, you know, what, what did help him was, you know, getting the devil out and getting the, the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit, I should say, into him. And so what was the difference? So he got saved. They, the, the legion of demons went out of him. They, they possessed the hogs and went down the cliff. And here he is. And he's just so excited that Jesus saved him. And he put his faith in Jesus, I believe. And then he goes running up behind him and says, I'm going to get on the boat with you. I'm going to the next city. I'm just going to be one of your disciples here. And he says, no, you be your disciple there. My disciple there. You go and you go home to thy friends and you tell them. Go to your friends and you tell them what the Lord hath done for thee. And that is what soul winning is. You know, and, and hath compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And so listen, soul, that's exactly what soul winning is. And we need to do that for our friends and our family and so on. Remember Andrew, of course, turn with me to Acts chapter 16. But Andrew, in John 1 41, he says, He first findeth his own brother, Simon. And he saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted to Christ. In Acts 16, notice this, we're, we're seeing examples of friends and family here. In Acts chapter 16, this famous verse that we use every day, every, every time we go soul winning. But let's look at the context here. In Acts chapter 16, verse 31, And they said, be, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Of course, this is the Philippian jailer, and he just asked the simple question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? But notice this. He tells him, he doesn't just try to get, he's, he's witnessing to a stranger here, okay? But we also see that he is also going to go after the, the man's family as well. Notice this. He says, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Now, obviously, we don't believe that if the father gets saved, the children automatically are saved or whatever. I don't know. I, I don't think the Presbyterians believe that, but they sure talk about how the children are, you know, made perfectly sanctified in their parents. We've got to baptize them to wash away, you know, all this stuff. And so, they, you, know, they, you know, they don't believe in believer's baptism like we do. And so, anyway, it's not that. That's not what he's teaching. What he's teaching is, is that, you know what? Hey. You believe, and if your family believes, they'll be saved too. That's a great message. And this is something for us to think about as soul winners. When we are at the door and we get someone like a, a mother saved or whatever, like go ahead and ask them, hey, is there anyone else in, the, in your house that would like? You, get, you just let them to the Lord. It takes a while to go through it, but just ask. like Say, hey, is there anybody else in your house that would like to hear the gospel? that you'd like me to share this with so that they can know for sure that heaven's their home, they're 100% sure. Because, you know, this is, a, this is a biblical method. You know, hey, your family can be saved too and go to heaven. Would you like that? Amen. Okay, well, good. If you want to bring them out, I'll talk to them too. We ought to do that. This is something that this is an opportunity. But listen, this man believed on the Lord, I believe. Notice this, verse 32, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. So he's like, all right, come on home. He leaves his post, you know, maybe after a shift or whatever, and he takes him out of there. I don't know how this all played out. Good night. He takes him home. You know, did he get fired? I don't know what happened to this guy. He takes him home, and he, he, they lead his family to the Lord. Notice what it says. And he took uh, them that same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house... He sat meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. So he got his, he brought them, he brought these apostles home, these soul winners home, I should say, and he got them, and they got them saved. He's like, all right, yeah, I want to hear, I want my family to hear about this. 
you know. And so we see here as soul winners, we need to be burdened for the whole family and be burdened with people and be looking to try to get whole families saved. And we also need to be looking to our, our own families and saying, you know what, let's get our family saved. And so this is a biblical, biblical method that we, you know, a biblical idea that we need to get our family saved. Our, this should be our earnest desire that our, our whole house and all our loved ones are saved. Friends should lead friends to Christ. Brothers leading brothers and sisters leading sisters or brothers leading sisters, whatever way you want to say it. Parents leading children. Children leading parents to the Lord. You know, and so on. And so this is so important. So for these closer friends and family that are lost, these people that may be closer to us, you know, what are some ways that we could maybe help them to get saved, to, to give them the gospel? Now, often it's hard to witness to people that we've known all our life because many times they'll, when you begin to talk to them about heaven, because of the fact that work salvation is being preached everywhere, people have a misconception. When you tell them they're on their way to hell, they're thinking that you're thinking that they're a terrible, evil person, right? Well, the fact is we're all sinners, but you know, we're not, we're not trying to point out how evil they are. That's not the point of, so, of soul winning. The point of soul winning is no matter how little sin that you've committed or how many sins you've committed in your life, God wants to forgive you of that. And it's, it's all of the, the, if you committed just one sin, it's enough to, to demand hell as a judgment. And so we want to see them saved. And so we, we want them to avoid that. And so we all deserve it. It's not about just pointing out how evil they are. That is work salvation where, you know, people think that, well, man, I just, I just, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to be a better person and all of that. And so you have to get past that with people. And so sometimes it's hard to witness to friends and family. And so we need to take time to really, you know, show them we love them and explain things to them to show them that it's not, we're not trying to point out how evil they are. We're trying to show them how we're all evil and how we all deserve hell and Jesus died on the cross for us so we don't have to go there. So what, is some, what are some ways? Turn over to Luke chapter 5. Well, one way that we could do this is to just simply host a meal for them. You know, I mean, at, at a time of a holiday or whatever, we bring these people to us. We, you know, you show people hospitality and friendship and maybe they'll be comfortable, Right? as they sit there and they hear your message and so on. And I'm not saying it's wrong to just go and knock on their door and just say, hey, Nathaniel, man, listen, I found Jesus, you know. That's nothing wrong with that as well. But I, I, do, I do think that this is something you could do. It's a biblical method. Look at Luke chapter 5, verse 27. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the, uh, at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. And Levi and remember what the Bible says. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And this is the same idea. He's just doing this constantly with people. And so I believe Levi had put his faith in the Lord. And he had made a decision to follow the Lord, to be his, his disciple. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. So he just decides to set up a big feast here. He says, you know what, I'm just going to cook a lot of food or bring a lot of food in or whatever. That's something nice to do. And there was a great company of publicans. So these are his co-workers, right? He said he's a publican. And so he just brings all his co-workers to his house. And of others that sat down with him. And their, and, but their scribes and Pharisees murmured against the disciples, his disciples saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And of course, Jesus is here with him. And they're just murmuring against him and just saying, man, you're just hanging out with the wicked publicans and the sinners and all of that. Now, listen, I want to be real careful about this. We need to be careful about our, our personal relationships having a, an effect upon us. But there is nothing wrong with going after and trying to win people to the Lord. I don't believe that this man was putting on some drunken party. He wasn't having, you know, some rock concert in his house to just try to make it real appealing to the world. He's just hosting a meal and trying to get some people saved. This wasn't a drunken party. This was just an opportunity. But listen, there are people, the Bible does say friendship with the world is enmity with God. So there's a, there's a line that we need to be careful about where we don't get just too close to these people. But hosting a meal, inviting people over, and preaching the gospel. Because notice, notice this here. 
But notice verse 31, but Jesus answering them, uh, said unto them, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so in this meeting, in this time of family time, he gathered these people and they were absolutely lost. Now the Pharisees were lost too, no question about it. But they were self-righteous, they were religious, they thought they were going to heaven, but the Bible says they were going to split hell wide open. And they were making people twofold, the children of hell, with their false gospel and their false works-based salvation. And so they were hypocrites. They were pushing this garbage, you know, and saying, well, what's wrong with you? Why are you over there with them? And this man, all he's trying to do is be a disciple of Jesus and follow Christ in fishing for men. And I believe that he was presenting the gospel to that crowd. Now you, you say, well, I, that's why I do it. I have all these people over to my house and we have a big party at my house because I, I want to just be a good example to them. Listen, if you're... I believe if you stand up and start preaching Jesus to that crowd, you might separate some people, right? You know, it's not just hanging out with them and just watching their movies and just listening to their music and just hanging out with them all the time. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about taking the time, having a, a family gathering, showing some hospitalities, so having a gathering of friends, and trying to get them saved. That's all I'm talking about. Don't, don't take this to where I'm saying, well, hey, we ought to just constantly be just hanging out with these people and having parties with them, block parties with all these lost people. You know, bring your own beer or whatever. We're not going to have that kind of thing. You know, Bible says, you know, tells us to not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But he also tells us to try to get unbelievers saved. And so there's nothing wrong with being hospitable and trying to get people saved. We just need to be careful that we don't allow the opposite to take place from what we're intending. You know, let's, you set, you set the, uh, the, the, the agenda for that night. You know, take the opportunity to give them the gospel. Maybe, maybe you want to have just somebody preach the gospel to the crowd. You know, I don't know. I've never seen that done before, but I'm just telling you what I kind of see in this passage. I'm, I'm just going off of the Bible pattern here. Did Jesus speak to them? Did he speak, stand up and speak, or did he go to individuals? It could be done those ways. So anyway, the other side of, the, of this coin, the Bible says in James 4, 4, Ye adulterers and adulteress, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So just some things to think about as far as that's concerned. Now, just a few more quick thoughts here about this. There are times and places, and I don't have a, a bunch of scriptures for all of these, but I'll just throw them out, okay? But a few more times and places that we can seek to fish for men, to soul win. Well, times where we gather together with family, with friends and so on. I think of weddings. I think of funerals. I've thought about births of babies. Um, holidays. When You know, a lot of times people get together for Christmas, Thanksgiving and so on. Graduations. Uh, you know, there are times where you ha you're, you're spending time together. You're maybe eating a meal like I was talking about before. Or, or there's just these times, and there's downtime. You know, maybe somebody's sick in the hospital. And you're just, family's coming in, friends are coming in, and there's a lot of downtime. You're just sitting in waiting rooms. Those are moments that you can take the Bible and open it, that up with somebody and get somebody saved. There are times Especially these times where they're, they're tender moments, where people are softer, these funeral type situations or sicknesses, baby births, you know. And so there's all kinds of special events that bring people together for various reasons. T there are times of waiting and talking and sitting and so on. And have some courage and take those, those opportunities to win some people to the Lord. I mean, there, there's nothing more fulfilling than leading somebody to the Lord. And then, but you know, what about how fulfilling is it to lead a family member? or a close friend or an acquaintance to the Lord. Somebody that you care about more than just the guy you're knocking the door that you don't have any relationship with. That's a serious thing. And so we need to just absolutely take this into heart and look for these opportunities. Another practical thing, uh, just in our daily routine. Now, this is a hard one, right? Uh, you know, business acquaintances, people we see at different shops or businesses or whatever, people we, we personally do business with and so on. I think my, my grandfather was, was just excellent with this. Um, and, and I'd like to follow his example and get better with this. But I remember as a teenager seeing him, he'd have somebody come work on the house. And before he let them go, 
from what they're doing, like whether they were working on the air conditioner or coming by to sell, you know, to update his insurance policy. He always gave them the gospel. Always. Always. That's a, that's a good principle. To take the time and those, and look, I know we're busy, I'm busy, you're busy, and we got stuff to do, places to go, and people to see, and all that stuff. But listen, we need to take the time to be a soul winner. If you haven't given someone the gospel, you know, do it in your daily routine. And so we've covered a few things about being fishers of men. And, you know, so far, we, I'll just recap this real quick and we'll close. And I actually have more notes, but I think I'm going to hold that off. Um, but, but here's, let me just go back over this. Who should we seek out? Well, we should make a point to seek out family. To seek out friends. And to also love our neighbors and our, the people in this world. To seek out strangers. And when, are, when and where are these times? Well, any time is a soul winning time. But we should, you know, take uh, opportunity to go with others. You know, especially during regularly scheduled soul winning times. We should consider going to some far place, either with a missions trip or, you know, supporting a missions trip. These are opportunities. Special events, marathons, special days, support those. Do whatever you can to be a part of that. Hosting a meal for a lost family, lost families and friends. Having to, uh, you know, taking advantage of special days, holidays, um, in times where people have downtime, just that are gathered together, and just in our day-to-day -day routine. And uh, I was going to make another point out of John uh, chapter 1 about how important, how, how big of an impact it makes, but I'll deal with that maybe next week. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you, Lord, to please bless uh, us as we go to lunch this afternoon and bless us as this church endeavors to do great things for you, Lord, uh, in fishing for men. Lord, we understand that this is a weighty matter. It's the thing you've sent us to do. And I pray, Lord, that we would get on that boat and 